Whew, that's a little emotional for me. It's emotional because uh, <clears throat> James and Michelle, to hear your son say uh, he's grateful to be raised in a Christian home and to know the backstory and to know what God did in your lives uh, so that he could make that statement. <clears throat> that's super powerful. And so uh, God is an amazing and wonderful God. <clears throat> and we're so grateful that he loves to save people and that he comes and finds us wherever we are and whatever we're doing. And his love overcomes all our objections. And he does just the most amazing, great, wonderful things. Can we celebrate a God like that? This is going to be a tough one. It's good to be back with you. I was on a study leave uh, for five weeks. And one of the things I really actually enjoy about my study leave is I get to come back and tell you uh, some of the things that the Lord shared with me while I was gone. And I kind of actually look forward to the Sunday to do that because I get four or five weeks away to pray and to spend lots of time uh, just sort of alone with the Lord. And I'm like, I want to tell somebody uh, the, some of the things that the Lord has to say. And so I do look forward to this week to get to come back and uh, preach again uh, after having uh, some time off and to share with you some of the things I felt like the Lord laid on my heart. Probably the biggest of which is that for the next, hold on, two years, we, I know, <laughs> for those of you who may be visiting, we've never done a sermon series that's gone more than a year. Uh, for the next two years, we're going to study the book of Matthew uh, together. Now, uh, at first I thought, man, Lord, this must be wrong, like two years, we don't do two years, that's a big, that's a, that's a longer period of time. But I got into Matthew, and I tried sort of shortening it, uh, and after uh, writing out 88 sermon uh, sort of overviews, I was like, there's no way we want to shorten this and try to do this uh, in a year. And as I was praying through this and thinking through this, I felt like the Lord was very kind to offer uh, to me at least some explanation of what he's up to. And uh, my understanding goes something like this. Two years ago, we were in the book of Revelation. And while we were in the book of Revelation, COVID was happening, which felt like a very Revelation-type event. And through COVID and other things, the Lord was shaking the foundations of the earth, as he said he would. As a result, lots of things crumbled and fell. That's what happens when God shakes things, which is why we are looking forward to an unshakable kingdom that Jesus is going to bring. But lots of stuff on this earth is human kingdoms, and lots of that stuff got shaken and crumbled. And then I felt like this last year we've been in the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis, as I reflected back and uh, was praying through it, feels like in Genesis, God is laying the foundation of a house. The foundation is not the house, it's the thing the house is built on. And what we're doing going through Genesis is we've gone back to the beginning. So after Revelation, it's like we kind of wrapped back around to the start all over again. And the Lord is re-pouring a foundation and we're being reminded, no, God is the subject of all things. God is in control of all things. God has a plan to rescue as many people as will let him rescue them. And so in Genesis, God is pouring the foundation, the basement of the house. And then as I was praying, I felt like the Lord said, and the book of Matthew is the house. <laughs> This is Jesus coming to build his house. There's no accident that in Matthew, Jesus talks about if you listen to my word and do what I say, you will be like a person who builds their house on the rock, not on the sand. And I feel like there's enough stuff that God has shaken and gotten out of the way that he's ready now to rebuild. And it seems powerful to me for the next two years, starting in the fall, to listen week in and week out to the, just the very words of Jesus. 
as Jesus explains to us how life is supposed to work, as Jesus builds his house on the foundation of Genesis. But his church, his kingdom in this place. So that got me really excited. The Lord also reminded me in my excitement, which I hope you'll be excited too, but he also reminded me that all remodel projects have the same sort of feel. You're very excited for the outcome, but it can be a long process and there can be a lot of work. And so I'm both excited and sobered by the fact that Jesus wants to build and rebuild something here. And so starting in the fall with the book of Matthew, we're going to simply go through that book together and let Jesus, our great teacher, our Lord and our savior, build and rebuild his house here among us. So I'm looking forward to that. Another thing the Lord gave me or reminded me on my study leave is that as a church, we have a responsibility for training men and women for service in God's kingdom. And that too often in the past, we have subcontracted that work to academia. And while there is a place for educational institutions, if you want to serve Jesus, the best way to do that is to be with Jesus. And the place where Jesus is most powerfully present is here in his church, and in his house. And God has continued to impress upon us here at Calvary that we need to make further steps in making things available to train people for ministry, for service in his kingdom, for being serious disciples. And so we have several classes and things that we have been doing in the past. We have some more that we're adding to that, all as part of the process of becoming a place where people who want to serve God wholeheartedly can be trained and equipped and given what they need to do that. Great job, Jacob. I am super proud of you. That was awesome. <clears throat> and you're right where you belong, back in the front row. Now for my study leave this year, I got to go back to England, uh, which was super special. Uh, there were many reasons why I feel like the Lord had me go to England, but one of them uh, was to be reminded of a trip to England that happened 20 years earlier uh, when Lisa and I moved to England. And this time going to England was sort of no big deal because we'd been there, I've been there many, many times. But I was reminded that 20 years ago it was a very different situation. In fact, I remember being at the Kent County Airport, uh, the Gerald R. Ford Airport, 20 years ago, getting ready to board the plane to move to England, where we were going to live for the next three years. And the very last thing I did before we got on the plane is I threw away an empty key ring. It was empty because uh, I'd given back our apartment key because our lease was up. And I'd given back the office key uh, for the place that I worked because I didn't work there anymore. And given away our car keys to the new owners of those cars. And there were no more keys left on the key ring because we didn't have anything to lock up anymore. And I was like, well, this is kind of silly to carry around an empty key ring. And so I threw it in the trash and I got ready to board the plane. And if I'm honest with you, I boarded the plane with a lot of fear. I was afraid, well, I just threw away the last vestiges of any possessions we might have. And the great fear was, are we making a huge mistake? What if we got this wrong? I was already nervous about why God was sending us to England. Now there was added fear that once we get on this plane, that key ring and all that stuff, it's all gone. The cars are gone. The job is gone. The apartment is gone. What if this was a colossal mistake? In addition, I'd never sort of lived overseas before. And we had always heard that in sort of Europe, there wasn't much Christian presence. 
And so there was this nagging suspicion. Are we leaving the promised land to go into the wilderness? See, no matter how many times you go on a journey, it's always into the unknown. And there's always fears and anxieties and apprehensions. Maybe you feel that this morning. Maybe you're here in the service and you're five years old and you're getting ready to start kindergarten in September and you're scared because you don't know what that's going to be like. Maybe you're a high schooler and you just graduated and although you were super excited to graduate and you tell everybody in the outside you can't wait for college, that as you think about moving away from home or going off on this new adventure, there's some fears, there's some apprehension. Maybe you're getting ready to start the new adventure of a new job. And silently you're worried about going from a place where you're known and where you know what you're doing to a place where things are different and you don't know what will be waiting for you. Maybe you're on track to get married soon and you couldn't be more excited about being with this person. But there is a little honest apprehension about what will life in marriage be like? How will this journey go? What will it be like to be with this other person? Maybe you've heard news recently that you're about to start a journey with cancer and you're gripped with fear and uncertainty how's this going to turn out what will be the end of this journey or maybe this week you've been thinking about the final journey of life the journey through death All of us are on journeys of some kind or another. And all journeys fill us with fear and apprehension and anxiety. We're leaving something known for something unknown. We're leaving something that feels safe and wandering out into something that feels unsafe. And so this morning what I'd like to share with you is four words of encouragement, four thoughts for whatever journey you or I may be on or may be going on from the book of Genesis. So if you have a Bible, would you turn to the book of Genesis chapter 46? If you need a Bible, there should be one uh, in the rack in front of you. In those Bibles, it's page 39. In Genesis 46, we're talking about a story that spans Genesis 46 and runs all the way to Genesis 47, verse 12. And it's a story of Jacob going on a journey. And what we are reminded in this passage is God is the God of journeys. And there are four encouraging things that God says to Jacob as he's about to embark on his journey which are the same words of encouragement that God is speaking to each of us for whatever journeys we are on or will be going on. Now, just to remind you of where we are in the story, Jacob lives in the land of Israel. His name is also Israel, and so the land is named after, will be named after him. He's living in Israel, or what's known as the promised land, But the problem is, is that there is a famine, a very bad famine in the promised land. Jacob has finally made the decision that he is going to leave Israel and move to Egypt where there is food. And we pick up the story 
in verse 1. So Israel, that's the other name for Jacob. He's called Jacob or Israel. So Israel set out with all that was his. And when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac. Now Beersheba is a very important place for Jacob. First off, it is the southernmost portion of the land of Israel. He has reached the edge of the promised land. If he keeps journeying south, he will no longer be in the land promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. In fact, when his father Isaac got to Beersheba a generation earlier, on his way to Egypt because of a famine, God stopped Isaac from going to Egypt and said, don't leave this land, stay here. And so Isaac stayed in Beersheba. So Beersheba is not only the southernmost point of the land, this is also where Jacob grew up. He's returning home before he heads on this journey to Egypt. And it says he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. He's offering sacrifices because he's scared. This is an act of prayer. He's asking, please God, will you help me as I go on this journey? Now why is Jacob scared? about this journey to Egypt. Well, I imagine he's scared for the same reasons you and I are scared about the journeys we go on. I bet he thinks he might be making a colossal mistake. Abraham, after all, went to Egypt when he shouldn't have to escape a famine and almost destroyed everything. Isaac was going to go to Egypt and God told him not to. Certainly this has to be running around in the back of Jacob's mind. My grandfather and my father both were going to go to Egypt. One did and it went badly. The other didn't because God said don't. And now here am I going to Egypt? Certainly Jacob has to be thinking, am I making a colossal mistake? This is why he has resisted at every turn going to Egypt. The famine has been in the land for a long time. There is food in Egypt, but he won't go. And now here he is. He's got no choice. The famine has not let up. There is no food. And so reluctantly, he's decided to go on this journey. But I think he's afraid that he might be making a huge mistake that he might be jeopardizing his relationship with God, his family, everything that he has, leaving what's known going into the unknown. I also think he's probably afraid because he's going to Egypt. Jacob's a nomad, which means he's lived all over the place. He's good at traveling, but he's only traveled in a certain area. He's traveled in land that is sparsely populated. Egypt is not like that. Egypt is a kingdom. Egypt is an organized society. Egypt has a pharaoh. It would be like someone from rural Michigan moving to New York City. This is a different experience. And I have to imagine that Jacob realizes that he has never lived anywhere like Egypt before. I also think that Jacob is probably afraid because by this point, he's an old man. He doesn't have the same strength or mental ability he once had. And whereas in the past, he could rely on those things for whatever predicament he got himself in, change is now hard for Jacob. He doesn't want to adapt to new ways. He doesn't want to have to try to learn new things. He doesn't have the physical strength to protect himself. And so as he gets ready to start on this journey, we feel the fear, the apprehension, the uncertainty that we feel as we get ready to go on various journeys. Well, into this fear, God responds. 
with four words of encouragement, verses two and three. God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am the God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. And in God's encouragement to Jacob, we hear four statements of encouragement to us in the journeys that we're going on. First, God takes us on journeys so he can bless us in bigger ways than we can imagine. God takes us on journeys so he can bless us in bigger ways than we can imagine. Think about this. If God wants to bless you more than you are being blessed today, and he does, then he is going to have to take you someplace different than you are today whether physically or metaphorically. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let me say that again. If God wants to bless you more than you are being blessed today, and he does, he has to take you someplace different than you are today, whether physically or metaphorically. Jacob doesn't know why he's going to Egypt. But we know, in hindsight, because God has revealed it. He says, I will make you into a great nation there. Now glance at verse 8 of this chapter. And when you look at verse 8, most of you have to turn the page. You see a whole bunch of names. It's a genealogy of sorts. It's a list of Jacob's descendants who are going with him to Egypt. If you look in verse 27 at the end of that list, Moses has counted them for us and tells us there were 70 people moving to Egypt. Now, Jacob doesn't understand why this is important, but we know why it's important because God's revealed it to us. If you go back, and we're not going to, but you can, if you go back to Genesis 10, you will see another genealogy, a list of nations in the world at that time. If you count them, do you know how many are there? Seventy. This 70 goes with that 70. And effectively what God is saying, Jacob, you don't understand this, but I've got to take you to Egypt because what I'm going to do in you and through you and for you is not just for you, but for all the nations of the earth. This one nation is going to be the means by which God will bring blessing to all nations. And that can only happen when Jacob leaves where he is and goes to Egypt. Because Egypt is going to be the place through which God will begin to bless not just Jacob, but the nations of the world. One of the hardest things about when we moved to England 20 years ago was that my dad was strongly against it. That was tough. He didn't understand why would we leave West Michigan where we had everything that we wanted, including a great job in ministry, to go off on this strange adventure. I didn't have an answer to that question. But I do now. And the answer is that God wanted to do something bigger than Lisa I could have ever imagined back then. And that involved going with him on a journey. 
And so all I knew back then was, look, you got to obey. You have to follow what the Lord is calling you to do. The same will be true for you as well. Since God wants to bless you more than you are experiencing today, he must take you on a journey to a different place, either metaphorically or physically, in order to make that happen. The purpose of your journey is not random. There is a God who loves you, who has promised to bless you, and will do whatever it takes to get you to a place where you can experience that blessing. So then first encouragement is that God takes us on journeys to bless us. The second encouragement from this passage is that the best part of every journey, the best part of every journey, the best part of every journey is that you get to know God better. Verse 3, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation. And then look at verse 4, I will go down to Egypt with you. Think for a minute about the last time you took a trip with somebody. It could be a missions trip you went on here at the church, it could be a sort of a old roommate's reunion trip that you took or a family vacation or whatever it may be. Just think about the last time you went on a trip with somebody else. Did you find that you spent more time talking to that person? Sitting in the airport or driving in the car or hanging out in the Airbnb? Did you find yourself conversing more about, well, where do you want to eat today? And what do you want to do today? And how do we catch the next train? Did you find yourself perhaps even tempted to fight with that other person? Why? Because on trips, we spend more time with the people we're with trying to figure out the unknown that we're going into. That's why we're tempted to fight with one another is because we're getting closer to one another. And the times that we have here where we are comfortable just doing what we know to do, we don't bother to ask another person, well, where do you think we should eat? We don't bother to ask another person, well, how do you think we get to that place? You don't bother to say to another person, look, we are lost. Will you please admit it? (laughs) But on trips, we do spend that time. The reason why God takes us on journeys is because we get to hang out with him. There are times to pray, to ask him, Lord, this is a new workplace. Who should I trust at this place? At our old job, well, we knew everybody. We didn't pray that prayer. God, this is a new baby. I don't know how to raise this child. It's a new adventure. It's a new journey. And when you go on a journey as a Christian, God goes with you. And the best part of every journey is you get time to spend with God, asking him things that we should normally be asking him but forget because we live at home and everything's comfortable. And so we go on these journeys with him and we are reminded Oh yeah, this is why it's so great being in a relationship with God. Is because he has things to say. Because he's super fascinating to talk to. Because when we draw closer to him, our hearts are filled with joy. And so the second encouragement is, is that every journey, every journey is a chance to get to know God better. The third encouragement God always has someone or something waiting for us when we get where we're going. It says in verse 4, I will bring you down, to, I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, 
and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. God knew that Jacob was gonna go on this journey. And so he sent his son Joseph years ahead of him. Joseph, his son, is second in command in Egypt. Imagine moving from rural Michigan to New York City. There's not somebody sort of second in command of New York City. But imagine that your child is the person who is running the city. Well, that would certainly make it a lot easier to move there. Joseph is well established. Joseph has resources. Joseph is well connected. And most importantly of all, Joseph loves his dad very, very much. And God has made sure that Joseph is going to be waiting for him when he gets there. Maybe for you, as you get ready to start a new school, God's already got a best friend. Just prepared, waiting to meet you. You don't know it yet. She might not know it yet. But the two of you designed to be friends by God. Maybe it's a Christian nurse who's been in the oncology unit for a long time and knows what they're doing. And when you show up for that first appointment, that nurse will specifically be there designed by God to encourage you, to comfort you, to pray with you as you go on the scary trip. Maybe it's a fellow countryman from your culture that speaks your language, who's already living in the country that you are moving to. And when you show up, here's this bright little piece of home waiting to welcome you in. For Lisa and I, moving to England, it was a local church, a hundred yards from where we were living. Just the most beautiful group of people, the city of light. The irony was, I was afraid there weren't very many Christians in Europe. And God said, oh, wait till you get there. A Joseph, already prepared and waiting for when you arrive. Fourth and finally, the encouragement that's from this passage is that God is especially powerfully present on the last journey of life. Now, I wrote this sermon on Tuesday before Wally Olson, Tom's dad, passed away on Thursday. As soon as that happened on Thursday, I realized that I was writing this sermon for Tom and for me and for others who've been reminded recently of the painful experience of death. Wally was actually my Sunday school teacher when I was a senior in high school here at this church. I knew Wally before I knew Tom. Wally's actually how I met Tom. And Wally had been, <clears throat> for all of that time, since I was 18 years old, a huge encouragement in my life. Tom is like a brother to me. And Wally's like a dad to me. And I was reminded this week of the pain and the loss of an encourager, of a friend, of a loved one, of somebody you care about. And this passage was an especial encouragement regarding the last journey of life. Look at it with me. Verse 4. I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand 
will close your eyes. Clearly, God is telling Jacob that he's going to die in Egypt. He's letting him know this is the end of his earthly pilgrimage. But in this, God makes a really, really strange promise. He says, I will surely bring you back again. Now remember, he's in Beersheba at this point. He's in Israel. He's in the promised land. It sounds like God is saying to him, I will bring you back to this land again. Well, that's exactly what God is saying. It sounds like God is saying, I'm going to bring you back to this place again. Yes, that is what God is saying. But there's a problem. If you read the rest of the story, Jacob never comes back to Beersheba. And he never comes back to the land of Israel except in Genesis 49 when he comes back in a coffin carried by his sons to be buried in this land. Now contrary to what some scholars think, I cannot believe that's what God means here. I do not think this means that God will make sure he gets buried in this land. It says, I will surely bring you back again. So what is going on here? I want you to look at verse 2 again with me very carefully. And I want you to watch the wording and remember it with me. Verse 2. God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, now watch the wording. Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father. All right, have you remembered the wording? Now turn some pages with me. We turn to Genesis 47, 48, 49, which is where Jacob dies. 50, the end of the book of Genesis. Exodus 1, the very next book. Exodus 2, Exodus 3. We've just turned about 400 years. Jacob is dead. The children of Israel are now living in slavery in Egypt. 400 years have gone by. And God has not spoken aloud to anyone since Genesis 46. Our passage is the last recorded time that God speaks audibly to someone until Exodus 3. Now remember our wording. Look at verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look at the burning bush, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am, verse 6, I am the God of your father. What does that sound like? That's basically the same wording that God used with Jacob on the way into Egypt. The very next time God speaks, he speaks to Moses, who is a descendant of Jacob, using very similar words to what he used with Jacob. But now look what he's added to it. I am the God of your father, verse 6, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of who? Jacob. Centuries later, Jesus will be confronted by some people who do not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And these people have come up with a thought experiment to try to disprove the resurrection. And so they invent a story about a woman who's married to a guy and then he dies and married to another guy and he dies and married to another guy and he dies and on and on. And their sort of like punchline gotcha question is, so if there's a resurrection, who would this lady be married to? And Jesus looks at them and says, you are in error. <laughs> you do not have any idea what you are talking about. 
And then he quotes Exodus 3. And he effectively says, look, the passage doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. And Jesus' point is, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. There is indeed resurrection. So what does it mean when God promises to Jacob, I will bring you back again? He is making a promise that has not yet been fulfilled. He's still on the hook to do this. Jacob's body got buried in Genesis 49. Because Jacob believed God, his spirit is currently in heaven with Jesus. When Jesus, who died and was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, when he returns again, he will bring with him Jacob's spirit, and Jacob's spirit will be reunited with Jacob's body, and Jacob will be raised from the dead in a resurrected body, and God will bring him back to the land named after him. This is the great news about the final journey of life is that God promises to walk with us through it. Now, for those who are not believers in Jesus, there will be a resurrection, but it will be a resurrection to eternal shame and contempt. But for those who do believe in Jesus, it will be a resurrection of life. That we can go back to Genesis 46... And we can hear God say, do not be afraid to go down to death. I will go down to death with you. And I will surely bring you back again. Back again. To places like Hastings, Michigan. Grand Rapids, Michigan, Maranatha, Palm Desert, places that we've been, places that we know, places that we love, to be with people that we know, people that we love, people that we have spent time with. This is God's great promise to us. This is why Jesus went on the journey he went on. Because God's plan was to bless not just Jesus or the nation of Israel, but the whole world, anyone who will let him. And the offer that God makes to every single human being, if you will let me, I will walk with you through the journeys of life. I will bless you. I will be with you. I will have things waiting for you. And when it comes time for the final journey, I myself will walk with you into death. I will be with you. And I will bring you back again. If you've never accepted that, if you've never heard that, if you've never believed that, this is God saying to you, I will do this for you. I will do for you what I did for Jacob, what I've done for every person who's put their faith in me. All you and I have to do is simply say, yes, okay. I accept. And for whatever journey you may be on, starting a new school, heading into a new relationship, living in a new place, going off into a new season of life, 
Just remember, God is taking you on that journey because he wants to bless you. If you don't understand why all the things are going the way they're going, it's probably because you and I don't understand the magnitude of how he wants to bless us. That the best thing of the journey is getting to know God. And so you and I can stop trying to figure everything out. We can stop trying to control everything. We can stop trying to make everything the way we want it to be. Stop trying to get to the point where we're not on a journey anymore. And we can just enjoy the trip with him. Wherever we're going, there will be something waiting for us. A grace, a gift, a blessing from God. Ask the Lord to open your eyes to help you to see what that thing is. Where is that Joseph? Who is that person? And if this week you've been reminded of the great and final journey, just remember the God who's led us all the way will not abandon us to death. The same God will grab hold of our hand walk with us through death and will bring us back again. Let's pray together. Now while your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed and it's just your heart and your thoughts, I want to give you a couple of opportunities this morning. The first is for those who have never accepted this gracious offer from God. I want you in your mind's eye to envision God saying to you the same thing he said to Jacob. I will be with you. I will go with you wherever you need to go. I will take you through the adventures of life. I will bless you. And when it comes time to die, I will bring you through that as well. And in the quiet of your heart, with your eyes closed, if you can hear him saying those words to you, I want you simply just to say yes in return. For those of us who are already Christians, I want you in your own mind to envision you going on this journey. Maybe you're standing at the airport, at the Gerald R. Ford Airport. Maybe there's an empty key ring in your hand. Maybe it's time to throw that in the trash. And I want you, whatever journey you're on, to take that empty hand and grab hold of God's. And I want you in your mind's eye to see him grabbing hold of your right hand and leading you step by step on the adventure he has for you. Can you visualize that? Oh Lord, give us eyes of faith to see that you are the God of journeys. We want to stay right where we are. But that's because we're way too satisfied with the simple lives that we have. You love us too much to leave us where we are today. And so God, be the God who takes hold of our right hand, who leads us on new adventures, who calms our fears, who prepares all things for us. And God, for any who this morning said yes to you, would you give them even today the assurance of eternal life that you are their God and that they are your child. Thank you for doing all of this in, through, for, and because of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for this podcast from Calvary Church. We hope this message has brought the light and hope of God's presence into your life, refreshing your soul for the journey the Lord has you on. 
If you have a spiritual need or would like to connect further with the work God is doing through Calvary Church, seek us out online at calvarygr.org. On our website, you can also find an archive of previous messages from this series. Thanks for listening.